Viking inside, and with me as always is... Savage Cat. Today we're going to go over another top five for you. A wonderful top five. This one's going to be a little bit more specific than what we did last week. This is going to be the top five bench press mistakes. And this is just what we've seen over the years. People do kind of that make you go, that make you cringe a little bit. And the first one, we're going to jump right into it here. The first one we're going to talk about is using your safeties. And that can mean more than one thing. A safety is more than just your actual safeties on the bench, but it's having a spotter while you're lifting. And I, I want to just touch on that because we had, we had a lifter who was working out by himself and got injured recently. And he didn't have a spotter and he didn't have safeties. He was doing a large amount of weight. But I think it's important to know that you should have the safeties or a spotter, even if you're not doing a huge amount of weight, because you never know when something's going to go awry. You never know. So just PSA right there, always have a spotter, always use your safeties, regardless of how much weight. It is the cool thing to do. So we're here with our... ER rack, and we're going to go over the safeties on this one. You might get to a place where you're at like a different gym where they don't have ER racks. They probably have like a more standardized rack. A lot of them don't have safeties. That's when you employ your spot. You have you should always have a spotter if you don't have safeties. I don't care if it's like one tenth the weight that you're using that you you normally do. Still have a spotter because something can always go wrong. Something can pop. Somebody can walk by and hit it. Anything. Don't want to go over that. We've seen some horrible injuries on the bench. So here we have our safeties. And Kat here is going to demonstrate how these work. So right now, I don't have the safeties set to my appropriate height. It depends on the lifter and your leverages and the height of the point the bar hits where these safeties are going to be good for you. So we're going to demonstrate what can happen when we don't have the safety set at the right height and we fail to lift. Now we do have a spotter for this. Scenario. Here we go. So when she lowers it to her chest, it obviously isn't going to be hitting the safeties. We do not have the safety set up yet, but the idea is if she was to roll it over her neck, that the safeties would then catch it because the neck is lower than the torso. So the safety should be up to the level, just a little bit higher than the neck, so that it catches the bar. Because we don't want to close off our airway. That is the number one thing. It's okay to land here because you can roll it back and get it on the safeties. Press, and back. So like Nate just said, choosing the appropriate safety height, you want to be able to get that bar all the way to your chest without the, hitting the safeties, but in the event that you fail off of the chest, be able to roll, roll that bar back and get your head out from under the bar. So we're gonna show you what that looks like. All right, so gonna lower it down. As you see, it's not hitting the safety, so you still get the full range of your press. But if she can't get it back up, roll it over, she's fine, she can get off underneath it, and everything is good to go. Next up, we're going to demonstrate leg drive. Now, we see a lot of beginner benchers doing bench press with just their chest muscles and the ancillary muscles that are around those. And that's fine, it is a chest movement, but what you have to realize is it's all actually a compound movement. The bench press is going to draw around all your different muscles from your feet all the way to your fingertips. And that's something that I think people neglect. You can add a lot of that, you can take a lot of that weight off by using your legs. And we're gonna demonstrate how that works. But so first, we're gonna show you guys what a press would look like without any leg drive. So without any leg drive, we're thinking that nothing down here is gonna be engaged, is what we're talking about. So we're, a person who benches without leg drive is really only thinking about their chest and shoulders during this press and kind of leaving out the whole bottom half of their body. So you may be able to see how loose the lower half of my body is. My feet are just kind of dangling here on the ground, making very loose contact. Very little support in this, very little stabilization. This is just using pretty much your chest muscles at this point. And that will build your chest muscles when there is a time and place to work out like that. But when we're talking about putting in effort, we need to practice and build muscle memory into our leg drive. So what that looks like is getting your setup and engaging the legs right away. So we're not only using them to produce extra power and force, we're using them for the purpose of stability as well. So right here, I'm pushing very hard that way, almost pushing myself backwards on the bench. My glutes are engaged. My hip external rotators are engaged, even my adductors are engaged, core is already engaged here. And you can see she's built a little bit of an arch, and we talk about like the Roman aqueducts. And we're passing the energy from the feet 
all the way up through the legs, the buttocks, the core, and into the chest. And you're moving that energy up there, and that's going to give you more pressing power in your press. And when it gets down there, we call it hitting the gas. You give it a little bit more and press it, press it up. Let's do a couple more. Hitting the gas, you notice her feet are pressing to the ground on the press, but she is maintaining that tightness throughout the entire and that is how we do leg drive. And it's important for a few different things, like she talked about stabilization, because we don't want you or the bar to be moving around. We need to have that bar motionless by the time it hits the chest, and then passing the energy up from the legs to the chest so you can have a heavier press and a safer press going on. All right, up next, we're going to be showing you guys something that we like to call happy feet. It's exactly what it sounds like, named after that adorable little penguin movie where they're all jumping around with their happy little feet. One thing that we find, especially in beginner lifters or even more advanced lifters who aren't used to doing a maximum effort press, they don't rely on their feet very much for stability, kind of going back to what we were just talking about with the arch and transferring energy. So oftentimes when a lifter feels the need to move their feet, it's that fight or flight kicking in that's the time when you actually really need to be relying on the pressure through your feet the most. Watch the feet, and this is what we don't want to see with the feet. So she's taking the, the weight down, she goes to press, she's having a hard time, people are kicking their feet out all over the place, she looks like a penguin laying on his back. Somebody's going to have to come in and wrap that weight for them, because when you start doing that, when you start moving your feet around, you lose all tension, you lose everything. So arch people, goes away. people hit that panic button, and real, don't realize that by in doing so, they've actually taken away their ability to complete the press. So they're now in a weaker position because they've taken their feet away from the press. So if this is an issue for you, you may want to just take some time when you're benching over the next few weeks and just think, where do my feet feel the best? Where do I feel the most secure? And intentionally put them there and be mindful of them throughout every repetition. And that's a good point. It's, it's definitely um, it's a, it's a practice. You've got to practice it to, to learn it. But it's, you, I like to think of the body in separate positions. So you've got, when you're thinking about your lift, when you're first starting out, you have to think about each segment of the lift. You start with the bottom, work your way up. So you think about your feet. Your feet are down, they're planted. And you move up to the calves, make sure they're tight. You move up to the quads and the hamstrings, make sure they're tight. The butt, the core, your lower back, your shoulders, all the way up to your head, and then up to your fingertips. Everything's going to be tight, including your grip on this bar. You're going to have a death grip on this bar. So another way that that could work is actually the exact opposite. So you will see some lifters set up first, myself included, with my grip and that pressure is the first thing that I start with. And then I work all the way down my body, ending with my feet. So either way you want to go, building that chain is going to be great just depending on what works best for you. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is a stacked wrist. Beyond that, with any movement, you do want to remember that word stack, simply because you want to have your joints in the long, longest part away from your body with your joints lined up so that way they kind of click together like Legos. Because if you have your wrist bent or out here, you're changing the levers in your arm, which is going to change the levers all the way up your arm into your shoulder and into the rest of your body. And you're not going to have, you're not going to put the appropriate amount of power in the lift and you're also going to get hurt eventually. So remember that stack wrist. Just like for those of you that are fighters that have been in MMA or done any type of karate or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, one of the things they teach you is making sure that your wrist is locked and your fist is right above it, and then that wrist is straight down to your elbow. And you want to do that so that way all the pressure, all the weight goes down there, straight up and down, so then you're forming almost a 90 degree angle with your arm. And if you have it like this or like this, obviously you're now putting a large amount of weight on the back part of your wrist where you don't want that. So now the weight is now going down back here, not here. So we're not able to put the most pressure, the most weight, the most press, the most power into it because there's nothing underneath the hand here. You know, so now you're calling on this to be to work at an inappropriate end. All right, so let's show you first what a wrist with the lack of stacking looks like, and then we'll show you what a wrist with the correct stack looks like. So first we're showing you an incorrect stack. So that's going to be where I let this bar roll backwards in my hands and it's going to put a lot of pressure on my fingers and wrists. Do we see what's happening there? Okay. Versus a correct stack. It's going to look more like this. So 
you want to imagine you're holding the bar and you've got a death grip on it because you should. And when you're bending the bar and you're going to bring your elbows, so you're going to wrap your lats, but you're also going to make sure your wrists are stacked at the same time. And it will become muscle memory. Just keep practicing it and you'll get there. The last thing, our top five today that we're going to talk about is grip. And Kat is going to demonstrate to you different variations of grip. And I'll go over a couple different variations of grip. Most importantly, it's important that you practice and come to the grip that you're most comfortable with. But it also has to maintain legal standards if you are a competitive model. Absolutely. Right. Up next, we're going to show you guys some of the different grips and how to choose a grip that is good for you. A lot of the times what we see with lifters and uh, you know people in general, they see something cool on Instagram or see something cool on YouTube and they want to emulate that because the guy or girl may have a massive bench press, right? It happens all the time with you. You can bench 500 plus pounds and everyone's like, oh, I want to use the grip that you're using or um, they don't take into consideration that they are not that person. So their levers are going to be completely different. Maybe the, the length of their arms is totally different, which plays a huge factor. You also need to consider things like your joint health. If you're somebody with um, a lot of shoulder issues, elbow, wrist, things like that, that also is going to play a factor in what is the best, most efficient and safest grip for you, not just on the bench press, but on your deadlift and squat as well. What else helps with your joints? Fish oil. Fish oil. Where can you get fish oil? Viking strength. Viking strength. Well, as you'll see, she still sets her body up in the center of the bar. You should always look and make sure your bar is centered before you go underneath it. And when you put your hands, you get, get your grip that you want, you're going to maintain that central status underneath the bar. Just don't move your hands after that point. Left and right. You can move and slide backwards and forwards, but don't move them left and right or you'll have an under. So say what they should be looking at here. So what you want to look at here is first off the thing we talked about last, which is a stack wrist. But you want to make sure that you have a lot of pinky pressure because once you start with the pinky pressure, you're gonna pass it through all of your fingers and you're gonna have a nice tight grip here, white knuckle grip. When you the stronger this grip is and the more you're bending that bar, the better your energy transfer is gonna be from the rest of your body up into the bar so you can make the appropriate press. Your thumb, technically, legally, has to be on this side of the bar, and for safety, I would always keep it on that side of the bar. Your grip should come around. Now, you, you have to have all your fingers on the bar. You can't have, like, a pinky going out there like you're doing it like you're drinking tea. You have to have them all on the bar. That's legal, and that's safe. And you want to look for these different types of grip. This is a standard grip. So what she was doing is called a standard grip, and that's literally just... You know, beer canning it, but much smaller circumference than a beer can, obviously. Um, then there are other grips. There's lots of, if you Google it, you look up, there's lots of other grips. But everybody, I think, should start with a standard grip. That way you can kind of find out what feels good and what doesn't. Now, the width of your grip is also very important. You want to talk about these rings that we have. They're 81 centimeters apart. And you want to make sure, for technical and legal reasons, if you're a power lifter, you can go inside this or outside this, but you have to cover this ring if you go outside of it. If you're inside of it, you don't have to. But if you're outside of it, you have to cover that ring. It's a, it's a little point of fact right there. But if you're benching that wide out, you're going to be a very large person, in my opinion. If you're doing that, you're a much smaller person, I think you need to take a look at your grip a little bit. So we're going to, myself, I actually grip with a pinky right here. And I'm, I'm pretty wide, and I still grip with my pinky right here. Now, I do what's called a modified Japanese grip. That's not very important to know, but I basically want to bring my fingers up like this, still wrap my thumb around, and I bend the bar, and my wrists are going to be sat. But you want to keep the bar on this, the thickest part of your palm, right here. The two pads that you can feel on your palm, that's where you want the weight to rest. If the weight is resting there, then you know your wrists are stacked. So that's the little, uh, kind of little cheat sheet right there. If you feel it on the back of your palm, you know your wrists are not going to come out stacked. So if you're grabbing it here and you go to pull it out of the bar, you can already see. I'm not even doing anything and my wrist is bent. That's inappropriate grip. We don't want to see that. We want to bend the bar, get our thumb there, get it over the two big pads. And you can see I'm just sitting here. I'm not even going to lift it. But you can see now my wrists are straight and stacked. And so I know if I got under here and lifted this, all the pressure would go down right there. And that's exactly where I want. Thanks. Nice.